I am Gilles Saint Paul, uh, who is uh, um, coordinating the chair um, uh, called the Macroeconomic Risk, which is a partnership that we have with uh, SCORE, which is the major, the main French reinsurance company. We have had uh, this partnership for a number of years now. It's uh, focused on well on macroeconomic risk, which is an important set of topics and we, we, we are very grateful for SCORE uh, to SCORE for uh, contributing to uh, research at PSE. Um, this, uh, this chair, um, every, you know, every year, every wave uh, focuses on a number of different topics, different themes and um, um, Tomorrow there is the, the, the part of the macro days, which is the International Macroeconomics Chair Conference that would be, you know, introduced by, by tomorrow by Tobias, I think. And um, you will see from the program that uh, uh, the, the, each day is devoted to a specific theme. Today we are uh, uh, more interested we are chiefly interested in the long-term risks of the global macroeconomy, and uh, tomorrow it will be more about uh, 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 fiscal and monetary policy, I guess. So um, uh, that's all I have to say, and I will just um, give the floor to uh, Philippe Trenard, who is uh, 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 our partner uh, uh, at the uh, SCORE chair and will give us uh, a few words of uh, welcome and introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gilles. Of course, I will not speak too much because you are here for listening other people than myself. You will not know yeah. so much by listening to me. Uh, I am pleased and honored to open with uh, Gilles this conference. This is combined, in fact, uh, uh, conference uh, of the two share of macroeconomics. Uh, and the one on macroeconomic risk is, of course, uh, supported by uh, the SCORE Foundation for uh, Science. On uh, our side, we are very much interested on the topic of this conference dedicated to structural changes and their implication for macroeconomic risks dynamics and policies this is the title and i think it's very interesting uh, structural changes are very important for reinsurance and for two main reasons and the, the two reasons i think could be interesting for an economist the first one is that uh, insurers as well as reinsurers are much more concerned by stocks and the stock dynamics than by flows which is very important uh, and stocks are much more uh, affected by a macro uh, uh, variable that convey structural uh, changes, and they are most affected by them. And this is very important, and it's one of the reasons why we will be very interested to your conclusion. The uh, second reason is that structural change are escaping traditional cycles and the return of the same events, the same uh, macroeconomic uh, dynamics. And in terms uh, of risk, they are therefore conveying new, unforeseen, not well-known risk clusters. Not only one risk, but probably cluster of risk. The dynamics cannot be separated from the original risk. Therefore, the dynamics is itself part of the risk, uh, and the policies for adapting to structural change are themselves sources of new risk for the reinsurance industry. Let us just think for, of climate change. The policies are themselves sources of new risks, uh, unforeseen and unforecasted for reinsurance. No need to tell you that we will look at SCORE attentively at your analysis and conclusions. And before leaving the floor to the academics who will present their research, uh, let me warmly thank the Paris School of Economics uh, with uh, a special mention to Daniel Cohen. We are in the room of Daniel Cohen, who was a, a friend, a, a very good friend, and I admire 
uh, to Gilles Saint Paul, who is leading uh, with talent uh, and uh, and uh, Jane, you uh, sees a share, and Axel Ferrier, we are out whom the share will probably not exist, <laughs> uh, and to have organized this conference. It is always a pleasure, and moreover, a highly stimulating pleasure to work with them and to learn from them. I will offer you the best for this conference and also for tomorrow's conference. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to session two. Uh, my name is Morgan, and I am a PhD candidate at UCL in London. Uh, thank you very much for including my paper in the program. Uh, today, I'll present to you my job market paper. It's about the spatial and distributive implications of working from home, a general equilibrium model. In the past three years, we have radically changed how and where we work, following the widespread adoption of working from home. This change was triggered by the pandemic, but went far beyond COVID-19. Here is an illustration of this that I borrow from Nick Bloom, Stefan Hansen's and Carthur's new paper, where they use cutting edge machine learning technologies to analyze more than 250 million job posting vacancies in five English speaking countries. And here they report the share of those postings that allow for work from home at least once a week. And we see that it starts really low, all the way until the pandemic, increases during COVID, but remains extremely high even after the end of the lockdowns, stabilizing around 20% for all the flow of new jobs in the UK. We can think of it as a structural change in the way we do organize labor. Now this paper looks at three questions. How does work from home affect how and where people live? Should workers who cannot work from home care about this? And will work from home make our society more or less unequal in the short and long run? This paper looks at the impact of work from home on households through a novel real estate mechanism. The idea is quite simple. Work from home opens some new working arrangement for workers. And it changed what households look for in a house increasing the taste for space, you want to be comfortable to be productive at home, and decreasing commuting costs. You only have to get into the office twice a week instead of every day. This shifted relative house prices and rents between the center and the peripheries, and impact household housing tenure and allocation decisions. I will look at these. First, yes, yes. So the UK was already quite ready for work from home. It had been started a little bit earlier uh, and it did work particularly well. So also there is quite a, a large real estate pressure in the UK. So the office space is always a bit more constrained. So this is why it worked really well. Also, there is a freedom in the UK. Everybody likes to be able to have a little bit more flexibility. It's possible. So the professional so services sector in the UK is larger than the other country, which is a sector that's in the US? Yes. Yeah, that is a sector that is particularly well tailored. Services. Yeah, so if this is, but these are adjusted by occupation, weighted, okay. yes, exactly, weighted to the US occupation skills. So it means there are multiple equilibria because prior to 2020, your explanatory factors were all around. And we don't see uh, much difference within the UK and, say, uh, Australia, right? So there is, there is some literature, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Rosiansberg and Carter's paper, that look at this shift as a change in equilibrium. This is not the road I'm going to take in this paper. Okay. So I start by looking at some empirical evidence, but I will not show much of them today. But I have some very granular property level data where I do look at the housing real estate market in the city of London, using them in an hedonic pricing exploration because I have very detailed housing characteristics. On this, I won't show you much today, but I find a change in housing demand with an increased taste for space and a decrease in the commuting costs. Then I want to understand the drivers of these changes and the consequences on the households. For this, I build a structural model whose main element will be, so because I'm interested 
and should workers who cannot work from home care, I have to look at different occupations. Some occupations that can remote work and some who cannot. Because interaction between work from home and housing is my main mechanism, I need houses uh, that will differ by location, size, as well as tenure, if they're owned or rented. Households make endogenous work from home decisions. They decide where to live and to either to be a renter or owner. And the house prices and rents are determined in general equilibrium in each location. Here, the shock. So this is exactly what we were talking about. Uh, so I want to look at what is changing with the rise in remote work. In this particular project, I look at the change in remote work as a change in taste associated with working from home. Okay. Right. Uh, so I'm calibrating it with matching the work from home patterns in the first wave of the UK time use survey, 2016, versus the last wave and calibrating the preferences. From what I find in the baseline period, we have some aversion to work from home. Think of it as like a social stigma or you don't like to spend your whole day in your pajamas. And after we have some fondness, meaning the story here is that COVID made everybody work from home, people tried it, and they found that there's a lot to like. This is consistent, this idea, with the survey evidence from Barrero, Bloom, and Davis, where they have a massive scale survey of working arrangements and attitudes. They survey more than 30,000 respondents in the US and find evidence for a better than expected work from home experiences, as well as diminished social stigma. So here, to come back to your point, this is not the only way to do this. There could be two alternative ways to go. The first one would be the multiple equilibrium story in the Porsche, Rossiansberg, and co-authors. So here, because I am looking at household heterogeneity, incomplete market, and rich household decision, my focus is more macro. It's different. So it's not a pure urban model. I won't study these multiple equilibria in this framework. I could also think about change in productivity. I am not doing this for two reasons. The first one is that the technology available for work from home, internet and video conferences, was around in 2019. It improved, yes, Zoom replaced Skype, but we can't think about it as a massive technological revolution that would trigger such a shift. Moreover, and this is coming back to the fact that it's a more macro than an urban paper, here, because my focus is different, I am not modeling positive externalities associated with working at the office. If I were to model productivity as an increase in uh, work from home as a rise in productivity, without modeling these externalities, I would overestimate the positive output gains because I don't have this kind of balance force. So I am following this survey evidence and the approach in the literature of Delvental and Parkomenko, for instance, in looking at taste shocks. Can you, change, can you think of fondness as a change in equilibrium? Yes, I, I just, I, yeah, you can think of it this way, but I do not want to use change of equilibrium because I'm not exploring multiplicity or like uniqueness of equilibria in this framework. So I want to be quite careful in the way I... But I guess the number of equilibria is irrelevant to, to what you do, no? I mean, well, then if, yeah. comparing yeah, to new equilibrium with an old equilibrium, whether... Okay. The new equilibrium existed before, and not have any bearing on your conclusion. Okay, fine. In that case, we can think about it as a reduced form of a change in equilibrium, or a reduced form of like a change in agglomeration, uh, in coordination. So yes, this is just to be really transparent on how I'm modeling. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so this is one of the. Is there any evidence that this was perhaps driven not by that, but by uh, a change? So there's a minimum investment that firms need to make yeah. to make sure that the, those workers can work from home. Yes. So. Okay. So here, so I, I'm not yeah. saying that the whole of work from home is 100% clean change in preference. I'm saying that this is the way I go around in this model because I mostly focus on the household's decision. You'll see all the work from home will come from the household side. Because I don't have the firm so much, I don't model this, you could think about this entry cost. But all the 
qualitatively, this would all follow through, okay? All right, so a quick preview of the results. I start by comparing the two equilibrium in the long run, so comparing steady states, find some output gains that are mostly due to savings in commuting time. I find that households who can work from home, they are buying larger houses further out, and that the marginal owners or the marginal buyers are crowded out of home ownership. You can think about it as like a, a generalized gentrification shock for the whole periphery at the same time. I also find in the new steady state some greater consumption and real estate inequality. Now I also look over the transition, what is happening, and I find that the way the price pass evolved in between the, the two regions does depend on who are moving to the region. And I'll come back to that. Okay. Yeah. Classes. So you will see. Because they don't work from, from home and yeah, so, but so they could get closer to the city center. I will, I will definitely come to that, but you'll see in, in the end it doesn't happen. Okay, so what we have... In Lo oh, yes, absolutely. What we have here, just before getting to the model, I'm showing you two plots for the motivation on the commuting cost and the taste for space, loosely. So here it is about proximity to city center. I have house prices panel A, rents panel B, and each dot is one of London neighborhood, Acne, Camden, and whatnot. Here I'm plotting the change in house prices and rents between the year right before COVID and the last year of the data on the log distance to the city center. And we see a clear positive relationship suggesting that properties located further out did appreciate faster. Now what about size? That's also relevant for work from home. So here I'm plotting house prices and rents. I normalize by the price in February 2020. And I'm looking at houses of different sizes. So in blue, studio one rooms, red two rooms, green three rooms, orange four, and then the steel larger houses. And we see that larger properties also did appreciate faster since February 2020. So now let's think about it in a model. It will be a general equilibrium model where the city is made of two locations, a center and a suburb. All the jobs are assumed to be in the center. These locations do differ in commuting costs, housing supply elasticity, and amenities. Households do derive utility from non-durable consumption, as well as the services from housing and they decide endogenously if they want to own or if they want to rent. Some households are employed in occupation that can work from home. Therefore, they endogenously allocate their hours between going to work at the office, where they're more productive but have to pay commuting costs, or staying at home where they have to use part of their house in the production process. To fix ideas, heterogeneity is on income, wealth, where people live, and their occupation. This is a, quite of a quick representation of the city, really quickly. Two regions, suburb center. All the jobs are in the center. If you live in the suburb, you either supply work from home from the suburb or make a long commute to the center. If you live in a center, you can work from home from there or make a short commute to the center. Total, yes. How should I think of saying leads? So, yeah, so Leeds particularly doesn't work. So I've looked at all the cities in the UK. Uh, so this, this donut effect, this kind of uh, change in the size gradient happens in Manchester, Birmingham and London. So it needs to be big enough. But, but I mean, like... Polycentric ones, you mean? I, I mean, more like... So, so these days you have people... Living in oh, okay. Life. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't understand your question. Yeah, so that's not exactly what is happening here because most of the work from home is happening in a hybrid pattern. So you have to get into office at least two days a week. Therefore, people can move out to Barking or Barnet, but they will not move all the way to Leeds if they have to commute twice a week to London. So this is what my model is about. Okay, so there is a fixed amount of land and households make endogenous work from home decision that will have general equilibrium implication on the, the economy through house prices and rents. The preferences. We have household I. 
that is employed in occupation K, commutable or not, um, lives in location J, center or periphery, at times T. And there are three blocks here. So first of all, you get utility from non durable consumption and services from housing, H tilde. I'll come back on H tilde in a couple slides. And then we have the taste for work from home part, or reduced form for change of equilibrium, or reduced form for cooperation. Um, so we have these constants, psi work from home, and then eta H is the number of hours spent working from home. Then you have the third term about the neighborhood in which you live. So you have a constant parameter, epsilon c, that refer to extra amenities available in the center. So uh, yeah, so it looks a bit odd, but it's because there is no leisure. So total labor is fixed. So you can either do it at home or at the office. So you can think of it as um, basically the share of labor that's done from home. Minus chi times one minus eta, right? Yes, yes. Which would be the disutility from working uh, at the and during your COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for the so the extra amenities in the center because it's more dense in terms of restaurant, bars, theater, and then you have some extreme value taste shock that follow a gumbo and that represent each household's own preferences on each neighborhood. Yes. And then maybe we have a bit of software. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there won't be any double feedback mechanism. I mean, that's really interesting. And this is, I think, uh, the next paper that I would like to write. But in this framework, this is exogenous. Amenities and jobs do not move. All right. So now the labor. Yeah? So here I only have two occupations. You will see, like I'll present the labor block and you will see how uh, like efficient unit of labor are built and people are compensated and that will be a bit clearer. Then we can come back to your question, okay? So I do have some evidence, I have some data on which occupation can be work from home uh, from the Nick Bloom and Stefan Hansen's data. And so I do see the workability of the economist versus the lorry driver. Uh, but here I'm just making two groups. Okay, so every household has no leisure, but a total time allocation of one, where they work from home, eta H, or from office, eta O. And when they work from office, they have to pay commuting costs, psi, that depends on where you live. All the commuting costs are in terms of time. Now, if you work at the office, you create efficient unit of labor from office, NO, that follow this specification. So AO is some common productivity parameter, for everybody at the office. And then you have some idiosyncratic productivity, new I. Then eta O is the number of hours you spent working there. Theta is weight of labor in production, and I'm normalizing office space to one. Now you can also decide to work from home, creating efficiency unit of labor at home, NH, following similar specification. So AH is a common productivity at the office. You see that here it is occupation specific, so it will be zero for the occupations that cannot work from home. Then you have new I, which is idiosyncratic productivity, the same one as what you would get at the office. Eta H, hours spent working from office. And then you have this H min parameter. This is a constant, and this is the space that you need to work from home. The idea is that to be productive at home, you need a desk and maybe an office space. If you have a house that's much, much larger, you won't be much more productive. If you don't have this, it's harder to produce. So this is why I'm modeling it in this way. But H, so theta is between zero and one? Uh, yes. So basically you are telling us that there are decreasing returns to each kind of labor. So they are imperfect substitutes. Yeah, so each in the way, yeah. So in the way each efficient unit of labor is built, yes. And then they are aggregated in a C, yes where they are imperfect substitutes, according to macro, micro evidence. Yeah, but uh, and it's hard to believe that in the past you had, you know, eta h equals zero or n. So yes. Uh, it's it's I, hard to believe your first graph if uh, there is mm, so much you know, complementarity. OK. OK, I take your point. Um, I could think about maybe a specification where I have some fixed cost 
for working from home, where I would have more corner solutions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there are uh -uh. Uh -uh. Yes. But is h min is just a constant? I mean, yeah. it's not. Sorry. Yes, it is a constant. Basically, uh, nh is eta h power theta times something times the shock, and that's the same for n pole. Yeah. But I'm saying, yes, you're right, that they are imperfect substitutes, and then I will not have a lot of corner solution for the people who can work from home. That's an artifact of my model. I think you can tweak it with some non-convex entry costs. Uh, yes. However, what I'm really like structural change of work from home is about hybrid remote work. So this speaks no, to at least this part. More discussion. It okay. More discussion. Okay. Uh, like, you know, maybe indeed what I do at home is not the same thing as what I do in the office, these are different tasks. Right? Yeah, but the imperfect complement like substitutes. I teach and I need students, and from home, uh, I do research and I have faculty meetings. But that's, I, that's taken into account. <laughs> that's uh, taken in. Same tasks, and therefore they are imperfect substitutes. Yeah, but this is taken into account into that C, yes. Um, so, yeah, households are paid wage WT per overall efficient unit of labor. Now, housing, you can either own or rent. House prices and rents depend on your location. Now, services from housing, H tilde, that enter the utility. You enjoy, basically, if you're an owner, you have some extra utility from owning, omega greater than one, because you like to be at home. Uh, and then you have, basically, you enjoy the size of your house minus a share of this H min, this office space, if you work from home. It's the idea that as soon as you work from home, you set up a desk chair, your monitors, and you can't do yoga in this room anymore. You enjoy it less. Uh, if you're a renter, no utility bonus. Owners pay some, non -comp uh, some compulsory maintenance costs to offset depreciation. Renters don't. And finally, if you are an owner and want to sell your house, you have to pay some non-convex adjustment costs that are a fixed share of the value of what you're selling. In this economy, you can also save in a risk-free assets. Uncollateralized borrowing is not allowed, but you can borrow against the collateral if you own a house. All right. Yes. Who owns the rental I'll come to this. It's a rental company. It's not the households themselves. Um, okay, so really quickly, the recursive formulation, just to get an idea of how the model is structured. I won't show you all of them. Uh, but the VN is the value function of a household which starts without owning a house. Uh, the states are liquid wells, idiosyncratic productivity shock, occupation, location, and then epsilon is the taste shock for the neighborhood. And you basically maximize the value function from living in a center plus taste shock in a center and living in a suburb plus taste shock in the suburb. The value function to live in either the center or the suburb will just be maximizing between renting or buying. And the renter's problem, just as an illustration, you maximize non durable consumption, the size of the house you're renting, um, how many hours you go to the office for, and your liquid wells. And your continuation value will be taken over expected productivity tomorrow and expected taste shock tomorrow. Yes? Um, why do you need the rent in buying? That gives me, so basically, this, the renting versus buying will interact quite a lot with where people locate in the city and how much they can afford. It will be quite important. I will really look. People move a lot in this dimension. You will see. Okay. Quickly, the supply side of the economy. So final good sector, uh, constant return to scale, output is equal to efficient unit of labor in this sector. Perfect competition pins down the wage to one. Now, the construction sector. I have two, one in the center, one in the periphery. They're solving this problem, and every new house is built using a Cobb Douglas technology with efficient unit of labor, and L, which is amount of land permits that are issued in a given neighborhood. Uh, because labor is fully mobile, the wage needs to be the same one as in the other sector, which gives us housing production functions in the two locations. Now to come back to your question, who owns the rental companies? Uh, well, there is two rental companies, one in the center and one in the suburb. They cannot change location. They are perfectly competitive. And the rent is pinned down as this user cost formula. Phi is some peer period operating cost of renting. And then that depends on prices, 
prices tomorrow, and depreciation. They can buy and sell frictionlessly, but they don't make any profit. So in this economy, there will be a government that owns the land permit in order to extract the profits from the construction sector and waste it in the English Channel. That's it. Yeah. So there is not. A rental sector is fully competitive, so there is no profit. But th there are some dividends from the construction sector that are thrown away by the government. All right. So this is for the model. I solve it numerically using a mixture of the nested endogenous grid point of Drudel and the DC continuous, uh, discrete continuous CGM with taste shock of each Kakov and Kaufers. The parameterization strategy is mixed. A set is fixed from the literature. Um, a set of parameters is calibrated outside the model to match moments, and a set is calibrated jointly inside the model with the method of simulated moments. Here it's quite a large model. I won't show you all the parameters, but I want to be quite transparent on the ones that matter. So they are the ones about labor, utility, and construction. So about the labor. So first of all, this H min parameter, I am calibrating it to represent an office space of 10 square meters. This is in London, as good as it gets. Um, the productivity, I'm normalizing it at the office to be one. And then I assume that common productivity from Ohm is 0.81. Here I'm using the new evidence from Gibbs, Mengel, and Simros that just came out in JPE Micro that look at workers employed in an IT um, firm and how their productivity changed when they switched remotely to work from home and they find a drop between eight, uh, sorry, nine and 20%. Elasticity of substitution, I'm taking the estimates from Delvental and Parkomenko, imperfect substitutes. Now for the transports, um, I'm taking estimates from Davis, Ghent, and Gregory that account for 25 minutes one way from the center and 47 minutes one way from the suburb. Here I've asked TFL for some London specific data. I'm still waiting to hear from them, so hopefully, in the next estimation of the model, it will be London specific. Now the utility. The discount factor matches the medium wealth to income ratio. Uh, the taste for work from home, told you, matches work from home pattern. I'll come back to this in the two different steady states. Utility bonus from owning uh, is identified using the share of renter in London. And finally, the extra amenities in the center I do target the ratio of prices in the suburb versus the center. Elasticity of substitution also matter. I'm taking values that will be in the range of size. I take the average value for the suburb and I assume a little less elasticity in the center, one of 1.5. And finally, in my model, the center is inner London, which are roughly zone one and two of the underground, and that accounts for 20% of the surface of the city. Yes. And the variance of the boundary is the variance of the 0 0.05. Um, it's quite it's quite standard. I'm having a specification also is 0 0.02, I think. Okay, so you want to check what Okay. Okay, okay. No. I don't. But there will be some sluggishness from the non-convex adjustment cost from housing. 10 minutes. Yes. I have 10 minutes. Uh, all right, so I'm re-optimizing. OK, I've re-optimized. This model is working well in matching where the people live inside the city overall, but also by occupation and by income quintiles. Uh, so this is important because this is what will change uh, between the two steady states. OK, here, before we change to the experiment, I just want to show you this because this is informative of how the model works. This is the policy function for the probability to live in the center. It's a probability because we have taste shocks. And you see it's for a household that doesn't own a house. And we see that it's not monotonic nor smooth in liquid wells. It is because, so center is more attractive because of the extra amenities and the lower commuting costs. So <laughs> it is um, therefore more extensive. So the richer the households get, the more they can move to there. But then at some point, they become wealthy enough and they would buy a house in the suburb, but keep being renter in the center. And this is why we see this drop here. The relative attractivity of the center decreased. This is for these kind of mechanisms that I need also the tenure decisions. And then we have a second kink. 
at the point where the household would become able to also buy in the center. And then the slope steepens. Okay, so now I'm doing these change in taste experiments, starting by comparing the steady states. We'll look at transitions later. And what I do find overall is that there is a greater output that comes from the complementarities between the two different works and also from savings in commuting. Households, there is a total increase in housing demand and house prices and rents increase everywhere, but more so in the suburb because of the decrease in commuting costs. So this is really contingent on your calibration, the output gain. It is, yes. So you start from a situation where people like too much, I'm not sure. I'm well, it what is. What are the output gains? Because, because people, so they come from. If I live in the center, I can still work from home, right? Yes, you can. But so the fact that productivity of working from home is very high, then even though I am next to the office, it is more efficient productively uh, to work from home. So why, why is it that if I increase the taste for working from home, output should go up? Because so for two reasons, there is the in terms of commuting costs, there is first a direct one. So these households are not wasting any time commuting, they supply more hours. And we do see that there is greater labor supply from the telecommuters. Also for the non-telecommuters, because the telecommuters moved out to the center, that freed up space. And some of them managed to move closer. And yes, sure, they have to commute, but they commute less. So the gains come from the people who already lived far before the change in preference. The gains, yeah. the gain from comes from the people who did very little work from home because they didn't like it. Now do a lot more, so they commute less, waste less time. This this like was a bit distortionary if you think about it this I way. See, yeah, okay. They, they didn't like working from home. Yeah. So there was an increase, uh, too high a supply for one of these two inputs and. Uh, Okay, so now... I don't know if this output concept is really relevant. I mean, so suppose that, uh, you know, uh, people uh, stop... Uh, suppose that people eat less and they instead they go skiing more, okay? That's a structural shift uh, in preferences and it's going to have an effect on measure GDP for some reason. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, no. And yet, you know, uh, what does it mean, right? Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that this GDP is. GDP would fall. Okay. So what? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that there was like a misallocation. That's like I, I'm not claiming anything like this. I'm just claiming that we supply more labor coming from both occupations, and that there is greater GDP. Sure. Now where the biggest difference will happen will be across the distribution. So in the last six minutes I have, yes? So I understand where this is coming from in your work, but I think, is this factual? I mean, this is not just something that you say, it's Because we now have productivity data that seems to say that output initially increased, but then it, our productivity initially increased, but then it increased because people are less motivated. So yes. Yeah, here, I'm not sure you saw the setup of the model, but so the productivity is lower. And so what is happening in, is in really like total work time. And this, as look in the data that I get from the UK, we see an increase in total hours that's been put as well. But I'm happy to discuss that in, in detail after. GDP is net of commuting costs. No, my GDP is, is, so yeah, the saving in commuting costs are responsible for this increase in GDP. But there's also the more efficient mix of input. Yes, right? but the biggest, the share of that? I have not done this decomposition yet. Just make those perfect substitutes. You already have me being less productive at home. Am I, is that not a perfect substitute to working from the office in some sense? Once I've conducted, once I've for So you're less productive to work. So then you will get rid of that second effect. Yeah. Okay, I'll make this decomposition. Now I would really like to show you what's happening for occupation. <laughs> so I will uh, try to make my point. Okay, so the non-telecommuters, so the people who can work from home, apologies, they are shifting quite a lot across their tenure and location decisions. They have an increase in eight points in the share of them that own a house, mostly in the suburb. 
Also, the total of people who rent in the suburb is decreasing by two points, three points, which is the share of the population that's the most fragile. They're at the bottom of the wealth, the consumption, the income distribution. So these households are thriving and their consumption distribution is shifting towards the right between the two steady states. Now, the people who cannot work from home, well, here, the share of them owning in the center is dropping by four points. This is quite large changes, even if we have these small relative price changes. So these four points of less homeowners in the suburb, they become renters. Also, the share of them in the most fragile group is also increasing. Here, these, these households are on average lower income, lower wealth, and they have been crowded out of homeownership by this increase in new housing demand coming from wealthier, higher income households. You can think of it as a generalized gentrification shock. And an illustration for this is the marginal buyer, which is, I identify him in the first steady state, which is the households that will buy with a positive probability and that wouldn't with a little lower wealth or a little lower income. And this household would buy in a center with prob uh, in the suburb with probability 49. And in the second steady state, he would not buy anymore. So we have some crowding out. Now, in terms of inequality, if we look across four different measures of consumption inequality, we see that it increases throughout. Because of the, on the right hand side, people who can work from home get a positive income shock. And because on the lower end of the distribution, higher house prices and rents matter. Now for housing wealth. Total wealth inequality, if we think of it as the average wealth of the people who cannot work from home on that who can, increase substantially, goes from half to only 40%. However, the inequality amongst the homeowners do decrease. Uh, a good measure for this is the median to 19th percentile, and we do see that this is quite decreasing. It is the case because of two effects. First, a re-evaluation effect. It is the households that the assets that used to be the cheapest, the one in the suburb that did gain value. So sure, it decreases inequality in that sense, but also because of this composition effect. So the marginal owners have been crowded out of ownership and replaced by these wealthier telecommuters that came and bought. Therefore, the marginal, uh, sorry, the homeowners group is more homogeneous and wealthier hence the lower inequality on the intensive margin. Now, just in the last couple of minutes to fix ideas, what is happening across the transition? So this is still preliminary. They're still uh, being computed on my computer in London, but I'm showing you some mechanism. So here I'm looking at housing wealth of the people who cannot work from home. Let's start by looking at panel B. Uh, and this is the housing wealth of these people who started without owning. So these are basic, basically the houses that are bought by this category. And we see that when the taste shock hits, the share of the buyers decrease a lot. So the marginal buyers are directly priced out of buy-in. And this is immediate. And it stabilizes at a lower level than in the initial steady state. And now you will tell me, OK, but if I was an owner that owned a house in the suburb and it appreciated, I did beneficiate from this effect. And so here I'm plotting the house owned by these households uh, over the transition. And this drop exactly shows this, that these households sold their houses in order to respond to this increased demand coming from richer households. And what happened to them is actually they moved to the center but and real, realizing capital gains. But the capital gains and the level of liquid wealth in most cases were not enough for them to buy a house right away. So they became renters and built up slowly their stock of liquid wealth. And this has a strong implication on the shapes of prices in each location. But they are better off, no? So the ones that, yes, this very particular field, yes. The ones that managed to buy in the end. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not sure I got your point. I, I own a house in the suburb. Yes. The price goes up. Yes. And given my tastes, I made the choice of... And maintenance price. costs. Uh, and maintenance costs that it's harder for you to service. I decide to sell my house. Yeah. I might have decided to keep my house. Yeah. So even if I rent in the center... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm yeah, this, this, yes, of course. Yes, of course. This household will still be better off. And this, yeah, and this is so it's different across the transition versus the steady states for this particular group. And this will have implication on the path of prices. Uh, so in the suburb, you see that the way it adjusts to steady states is quite gradual. It doesn't shoot right away. And it is because of who the movers to the suburb are. So these are these households that just sold to the telecommuters, are moving to the center, but cannot become buyers right away. They'll have to build liquid savings, and so their housing demand will take some time to materialize. And this is why the house prices increase a little bit later. In the suburb, however, the house price adjusts directly to the new steady state value. And it's because the movers are these rich telecommuters that come to buy and that are wealthy enough to buy right away. So the housing demand increases right away, and so does the prices. This is what, yeah? Yeah, well, maybe finish your conclusion. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yeah, this... The price is not by arbitrage, then the price parts, they're not linked by an arbitrage condition somehow. Uh, two, 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 two. I would expect them to move. Oh, never mind. They are not linked by an arbitrage condition. They're determined in equilibrium by, like, supply and demand. But the households, they make the arbitrage on where they want to live. But I think... Uh, let, yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is, I showed, well, I didn't show today, but some empirical evidence of a change in housing demand. Explored it in a structural model. I do find that in the long run, we supply more labor. So that's that. Uh, marginal homeowners are crowded out of homeownership and inequality is increasing in the long run. Over the transition, it's a little bit of a different story. And the pass adjustment of the prices will depend on who the movers are in which, in each location. That's it. So yeah, I, I do want to come back to my earlier comment. Yeah, the point on leads. About consumption and equality. I think a lot of the work on home revolution has also brought about moving in different, moving to different and working from different cheaper cities. Mm -hmm. So people are now working from London two days a week, live in Bristol, Leeds, Birmingham, the other days where the price of this maybe 40% lower. They keep their London salaries, at least for now, so I do wonder whether that, that is not working a little bit against your, particularly your consumption and equality point and, and how you think about that in your, in your model. Okay, so um, I do not have the, the data for the UK. In the US, for instance, Nick Bloom had a look at this uh, and showed that indeed there is a third of these moves that is happening um, across cities. And yes, uh, surely that would very much go a little bit dampening this consumption inequality. Uh, two, 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 two. And especially since these people would be able to have London wages living in Leeds, for instance. Yeah. But this is a little bit beyond the scope of, of, the, of this particular study. I think companies are also re-evaluating. Yeah. The, people paying the London everybody the same. Yeah. But because of this hybrid nature of work from home, we can't fully dissociate where people live and work. So that kind of mitigates this concern to, to some extent. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> Last question. Ah. I have two questions. First of all, I brought up a few short short in terms of the, um, firms, uh, I mean, the employers. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 the cost or, or you are quite sure in terms of uh, interactions that they can be in the space, the office and all. Then my second question is about when you see the, the UK transformation of uh, moving from uh, uh, offices space to uh, in, in South and London to the Union. Yeah, so the, from first on the point of like uh, this conversion between commercial real estate to residential one, it is really difficult for two reasons. First of all, in the UK, there are very stringent uh, norms that prevent office buildings to be directly converted into residential. Mm -hmm. And also because structurally of like uh, the way these buildings are, large plants, very little window for walls, so they are not like fully built to be converted easily. So this is why we can really think of them as two separate markets the residential housing and the commercial. And it's true that this paper doesn't speak to the commercial one. Uh, yeah. This is the only thing about this. And then my third question, my first question <laughs> is about the uh, the direction of the firms, the firms and the employers. So here, the, here there is a little bit of like a reduced form version of this. So in the survey evidence, there is also the fact that the employers became a lot more open towards work from home. And so you can think of it as 
It is, I'm modeling it as a taste from the employees, but it could also be the taste from the employer. Here, the employee making all of these work to work decisions and the, ha the size and equipment in building this efficient unit of labor, you could think of it as being decisions from the firm and just the employees owning the firm, if that makes sense. So it's the framing of the, of the problem model. I think I'm out of time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.